um, bring composting into our valley. And so I'm gonna introduce Thad. Um, he is the manager up at Winton and he'll be sharing more about kind of their technology. Um, and then um, Natalie um, with Waste Loop will then share kind of what it means for our community and some of our pilot programs. So thanks, Thad. Well, first, thank you. Uh, thank you, Rachel and, and Carolyn and Wenatchee River Institute for inviting me to speak here. And uh, thanks, Amanda, for the introduction. So I'm, I'm Thad Shute, the manager of Winton Manufacturing Compost Works. So you can see right here is, is the facility. And this was while we were under construction. So we have now completed the construction of the facility as well as all the permitting and got through everything. So just for a quick rundown, if I can find the right, here we go. Okay, so if you remember the old, the Winton sawmill out there by Coles Corner, where we're at. So this is the actual mill building itself. It's about a 90,000 square foot building. We're not really using that at the moment. Where what, what we are using is out here on the deck. And I don't know where it went. So this is our active composting area. This is where it's all gonna take place. And you can see the leachate lines have been cut into the asphalt. We have piping to carry that away. These, these long pipes here are for the aeration and we have the boxes and all the technology and wiring buried underneath here. And this is our tipping building that we'll be using for the material that's inbound for sorting, for grinding, for blending, to put everything together and then laying them out in these, in these big rows and these big cells. So I'll go over that a little bit more here too. Um, we've also set up a retail yard so that we can handle people that are coming in for a pickup load or a small truck load bucket loads you know we can go that way too we've we've discovered on um on some clearing that we've also found uh, some really good soil up there and it doesn't have the same issues that you see with topsoil coming out of like the wenatchee area and stuff from um, pesticides over the years and arsenic levels and lead levels so we have some pretty good soil and we're we're doing some garden soils and and blending with the compost um but through that the screening process, we also have some rock and other project, products. So to kind of get things started on what compost is, there's a, there are several different definitions out there and, and there's a lot of misconceptions. Compost essentially is the product of a managed degradation of organic materials. So I put the emphasis on, on managed because you can say that something's compost or it's humus or it's, it's broken down but we have to look at it at a different level. That it's a managed process. It's, it's actually fairly highly regulated when, when we do it this way, as opposed to a backyard composting. We're hitting higher temperatures uh, for a lo much longer period of time and be able to handle many different materials you can't, just because of the sheer mass that we're doing. So that is the big thing in compost is time and temperature. So we're using the aerated static pile. So the, the rules that we are governed by show that we need to be at at least 131 degrees Fahrenheit for at least three days to be able to kill pathogens, and specifically salmonella and E. coli. So we're getting well above that. We're actually going to be running more in the 160 day, uh, 60 degree Fahrenheit range. Um, we're under cover for 30 days before we take it out. So we're sur far surpassing what the regulatory requirements are. But the way I think of composting, and I think you, you may wanna look at it too, it is actually really livestock management, but your livestock is microbiology. So, you're, so we're providing the habitat, the food, which is the organic materials themselves. You're providing moisture for them to drink, replicate, and to move as they move through the materials. And you're providing oxygen. And they are providing the work to break down all those materials down to the cellular level, releasing nutrients, releasing the organic matter, and breaking it down. So they're doing the work. You're giving them the habitat to be able to flourish. And so you're developing different types of microbiology through different temperature ranges as you go. 
So as we're in active composting, there's some things that are taking over and they're going fast and furious and your temperatures are rising fast. As those foods reduce in the ease of breaking them down, get into, and the temperature starts dropping, you're getting into other types. And I'm not gonna even try to pronounce any of them right now because I'll make a fool of myself. But trust me, there's some really cool ones. So the end product is, is stable as opposed to heating up and being able to do some weird things. So, and you, it also should have a, like an earthy smell to it, smell like really good soil. Um, it's high in organic matter, carbon, nutrients. So it's breaking down all the nutrients that you'd normally see in all the plants already. So they're still there essentially, and it should be full of life. So it should have a lot of different types of microbiology and a, and a lot of each type of species. So let me show you on the, that's right. On the, so on the end products themselves. So I've got some samples up here. This is your regular bulk compost. Well, what we're producing up there, or will be as we get, go full blast. And we have done a test, a test run too in the fall. Everything came out fine. We had to make sure all the equipment really worked and the system worked. So that is what it should, and you can smell it later too. It's got an earthy smell. What we're gonna be doing too is we're aiming at um, is taking it a little bit farther. So I've been involved over the years with uh, research on this and we've actually developed a, a pelletized compost where you take the finished compost and we're going through dyes and creating a, a pelletized version. And where that got started is it was as approached years ago by a sustainable no-till farm. And they came at us and asking, we know the compost is really good for the soil, but how do you get it into no-till? You cannot incorporate compost in a no-till system because you cannot till it. So we work with them and did a bunch of R&D and found that not only can you compress it into a pellet, but if you do it right, you can, main, you can put all the microbiology into stasis. And it's a dry product which has a long stable shelf life opposed to what you would normally think. Once it's rehydrated, the microbiology comes back to life. So by being able to design this and to have a, a very targeted um, precision agricultural bent to it and placing that right through the seed drill, we found that we can increase yields for farmers in wheat using only 40, 80 pounds per acre, as opposed to tons per acre, which you normally be doing and in incorporating it because we're targeting and being very precise where that placement is. So it's a whole different take on it. But launch from there was other crops. And so this is a product we're actually working with another company with right now. Um, this is called Turf Mend. And Turf Mend is using our granulated form of, of compost we developed. And they're blending it with seed and so another product too, that is what you do is like dog spots, um, holes in golf courses. And it's, it's a patch kit essentially for repair on your lawn. And all the studies have shown that it increases, it's got a higher germination rate of the seat, that it gets quicker coverage. And the, the buffering action of the compost actually helps with the, like the urine and the, from the dog. So it's, it's bringing that back and very quickly. So working with them, they've expanded very quickly since we helped reformulate that. And they're now in 48 states for um, distribution. So we just got another load kicked out to go get processed today. So it's been an interesting process. Okay, went and compost works. How did this all get started? Well, as I said, we got to repurpose old Winton sawmill. Well, I found out a little bit more of where this got started, but essentially a few years ago, you may be a little familiar with the whole Alpha Mega quarantine regulations and how that changed. Before they used to regulate that only on the commodities, on the apples and your backyard apples and transporting it. And uh, I won't get into all the details, but let's say they revisited that and decided all of a sudden that yard waste was now a commodity and that 
they were now going to regulate it. So they shut down all the transportation of those materials that were coming from the west side, were coming from um, Spokane area and coming to some of the composting facilities. So they shut down all the transportation of those materials, which were coming out to places that were going to, to agriculture and completely shut it down, which took out two different facilities completely. And it took out a large capacity of a third. So the state's composting capacity uh, just a few years ago lost somewhere around the vicinity of 200,000 ton of processing in one shot one signature. So the Department of Ecology was looking for answers of where else can we go, what else can we do? And so somebody figured out this, the, the old sawmill up here and it's behind the line for the quarantine. So materials could come in from either angle. So somebody called somebody who called somebody who called somebody who called me. So that's, that's kind of how we got out there. So we're like I was showing, we're using the log sorting yard that they used to use because we, we found in, in this that it is like over eight inches thick asphalt. It's really thick and really strong. So we can still cut lines in the asphalt and use them without damaging, you know, you know breaking it free to have anything leak down into the groundwater. So we are permitted for 62,000 tons annually. Um, I don't know how to give that a whole lot of perspective, but it, it's a lot of material that we could potentially go to. Right now, we are not set up to, to take all of that on. Um, we're set up to do a full build out of be 14 different cells rotating continually. And right now we've put in enough to make 10. So at about 60% of capacity, if we were going full tilt right now. So experience in the industry, I've already mouthed off a little bit about myself. So I've, I've kind of got into this industry on accident back in about 2004, 2005. And at the time I didn't know if it was like a promotion or a punishment and I'm still trying to decide. Um, and we've got others too. I mean, part of, part of our, um, I will say is we've got a lot of support on the backside too with investors and things that have experience in the industry. So we've got a lot of backup too to make this happen. So we're looking at inbound, both residential and commercial. We will be open to the public where people can bring materials in and dump it off out of the back of their pickup. Um, commercial, we were talk, we're already starting to talk to businesses. We're working with Waste Loop for outreach and, and um, education as well. And to be able to bring the material from restaurants uh, you know, the food waste issues, as well as the yard waste issues with the counties and municipalities and, and all of those things. Outbound, same kind of thing. Retail, showed you a little clip of our retail yard, but we're also looking at, at homeowners who've started delivering. Um, we were doing some last year. We've been bringing in material from another facility so we can sell and start kind of things in motion. Um, we're also doing orchards. Uh, Department of Transportation projects, like new schools, schoolyards, and multiple other projects that we've already started with. So the facility, we'll get into a little bit of the, the technology that we're running. So this is an aerated static pile. This is a technical, so even more technical is positively aerated. So we're pushing air through it. So, using gore membrane covers. So it's the same thing as like a gore coat. It's the same material. So what it does is it allows that material to breathe and air to pass through it, but it, it prevents the moisture from going out. As opposed to your coat, it's in reverse. You're keeping the rain out. This is keeping the moisture in, which also traps the volatile organic compounds and the odors and holds them inside. And it also gives you some insulation as well. So even the surface of the, of the pile is reaching temperature. So all of our blowers are set up on, on computer control. So it depends on how we want to set them up um, on a time on, time off, how, how much they're blowing. And they can 
temperature and oxygen monitoring. So we have probes that are going in there. They're measuring, they're taking a temperature like in the middle, higher, and at multiple levels. So you can see how it trends and you can track it. And then oxygen monitoring, technically it's like oxygen, de oxygen demand uh, monitoring as opposed to actually measuring the actual um, oxygen in there. And then data collection and recording. So this is, this is the fun part. This is probably the highest tech that's in the state right now on, on composting facilities. It's right here. I can, when we were doing the, te the test run, I can be in bed with my laptop watching the temperatures change in the pile when the blowers come on and come off. And my wife thinks I'm nuts. <laughs> so acceptable materials. What I like to think of as a rule of thumb, if it can grow in your yard, you can eat it at your table, we can accept it. I mean, it's a pretty easy way to think it. Yes, I'm sure in your minds you can already figure out some exceptions to this rule. That's why it's just a rule of thumb. But what we are permitted for is yard debris, wood waste, land clearing debris, food processing waste, and agricultural waste. So all of those kinds of materials and, and what they'll, they'll do in the, in the tipping building is, is grind those, mix them at the proper ratios to get the right recipe to before it's placed in the piles. What's not accepted, painted, treated wood, plastic, glass, no biosolids. I don't know what everybody's heard, but I know that was one of the first thing that I got hit on in a community meeting up there when we were first starting is I was attacked on biosolids. No, no biosolids. I don't want it. And it also, and you know, many people may not realize this, but if you run biosolids, it also keeps you out of the NOP, the National Organic Program. So it cannot be used in, in organic agriculture. So that blocks that. And it stinks. So, or other, there are some other contaminants. One I would like to point out, please no garden gnomes in your yard waste. This is, you would not believe the thing that people put in their yard waste. It's been amazing what I've seen over the years. I used to say that it used seen everything but the kitchen sink and then a the kitchen sink showed up. So I, and we, I remember at our old facility, we actually would collect the oddball stuff and then Finally, there was so much oddball stuff. It's like, just get it, get it in a truck and get it to the dump. So if you look at the compost works tagline that we have, and you look in our, on our website, it's like compost works for community, compost works for agriculture. Com and that's a really great way to think about it. But what is tying those together? Specifically, in my mind, the big thing is soil health for the actual compost, which goes into agriculture, lawn, garden, construction, soil restoration, and a lot more. So what is that soil? I gotta make sure, okay, so soil health. There's multiple things you've got going on. One is just the soil structure itself. It's, it's bringing more structure to that soil. You're bringing organic matter to it. Um, it adds the porosity to the soil, which increases your water holding capacity. It increases the cation exchange in your soil. Um, it's bringing nutrients in there. But one of the big things that we've discovered too in, in all the test runs and the R&D that we've run in trials is a lot of it is so much about the biology. And when you look at, on a lot of the soils, especially in Eastern Washington, we're really low in organic matter. And that prevents that biology from really taking off. So it's really about that life and that in the biology being able to bring in the, the nutrients and to turn those nutrients into plant availability. Um, we've also found too, if when you have that, the right microbiology in there, it actually suppresses, especially soil-borne fungal diseases. And we've seen that over and over again. There's many different soil diseases just get, just get knocked back. They're, they're weaklings whenever there's competition. So carbon sequestration, compost is about 25 to 30% carbon. So every time you're putting that into the soil and burying it in there, you're sequestering carbon. Now you can argue that if it gets tilled up, you're opening it back up, but if you're putting it in there, you are tucking away that carbon. 
methane reduction. So normally if these same organic wastes are going to the landfill, they're gonna be in an anaerobic condition. And the anaerobic condition brings on the types of microbiology that produce methane. So methane depends on the study you look at. Um, I've seen one study showing methane um, has 100% time, I think it's 100% times more heat holding capacity than CO2. Now it does break down faster than CO2. So then other studies are showing that essentially it's 25, 35 times worse than CO2. So we're, we're working towards methane reduction. And then if you just look at overall landfill space, taking those organic materials frees up or reduces the need for landfill space. So getting back to soil health, I had to show you this one. This is one of our studies. This was done by Washington State University. Um, they were doing some soil studies and they decided to do one with our pellet. This is actually a canola, um, this root right here. This is the same root about three weeks apart. So this is the tap root off of a canola plant. And you can see as it's coming down, this is the actual pellet right there. It touches it and you can see these little filaments, and these little feeder roots are coming out and grabbing it. Within three weeks, it encases it almost into a cocoon. It found something it really likes. And this is the difference. If you look at, if you look at the rest of the soil medium and what they did is they used native soil to, to that area of, of where this test was done, which I think was up around Davenport. Um, it's not doing anything like that out in here. You don't have the organic matter. You don't have the life, the microbiology. So there's something really interesting going on here. And you can see how much that taproot has swelled up since. So incentives, compost instead of what incentivizes getting people to buy compost and use compost. Well, come back to me is the main point is the improved soil health, plant health. So that's an easy one for me. But what we are working on to kind of change things up a little bit is we're developing what we're calling the carbon network. So essentially kind of going towards the whole farm to table concept and then going table to farm concept and adding that on for the complete cycle. Um, we've discovered from all of the data that we're collecting now through the process from inbound processing, composting, time, temperature, regulatory requirements, uh, pathogen kill, outside lab results, and then outbound of where it goes, we would realize that we can tie all that together and follow that through the cycle and know for at least a, by a percentage of how much somebody's material that they came in with a load of yard waste from Leavenworth, how much of that went out to these different projects. And we can track sustain sustainability metrics and then get that back, that information and do reports for for customers and at the same time those who are involved with this and are working on that we can get discounts to those that are feeding into those same customers and be able to just turn that whole cycle on the regulatory side for incentive there have been a few changes over the just last couple of years so rcw 43 19a120 um i'm not going to get the whole of it but what it's doing is telling communities, uh, municipalities, counties, and every state agency that wherever they can use compost, they must use compost. So that includes roadsides, wherever they strip a roadside and they need to replant um, parks, playgrounds, wherever they're going, whatever they're doing, where some place that you could use compost, they're supposed to use it. Now there are exceptions, based on distance or too expensive or hard to use. And that's where these come in because it takes away a lot of the excuses that they would normally have because now you have an easier way to use it or now we're closer and it can reach it. So we're working towards that. But so those are some of the incentives. That's, I, I guess that would be kind of a maybe considered a negative cons, um, incentive because it's telling them they have to do it. Then this one came around just this year, HB 1799. It was just signed into law by the governor, what, two weeks ago. I don't even know what the code is yet. 
Uh, they probably have one. But this is taking that earlier one and going a little step farther. So not only are you supposed to use it, but now they're, they're set up a timeline to require communities and businesses to mandatorily sep source separate out their organics out of their, out of their waste stream and go to composting or food programs on, or what, whatever it may be and not to the landfill. So they're forcing them. And at the same time, they've got a positive incentive going to farms and the users, and they're looking at grants to be able to incentivize them to use it for, for monies to, to put that into play. And I think I'm done and ready to pass it on. Natalie, you're on. Hello, everybody. Um, my name's Natalie. Uh, I'm working with Waste Loop as their community compost coordinator. Um, so thanks for the intro on what compost is. Now we kind of know what the facility is going to look like. Um, so I'm going to kind of talk to you guys about how it's going to look in our community. Um, so kind of starting off, we can get just like a good visual of what the waste um, in Leavenworth looks like. Um, so there were a couple uh, waste audits that were done um, at the Dryden Transfer Station. Uh, we took the averages of the two to get um, these results. Um, so total, there's 2,386 pounds of waste collected, um, which is, yeah, as Ari said, very illuminating, you know, when you kind of, or as Amanda said, when you look at uh, the waste, you can kind of see so much of it is compost. It's um, just, oh, yeah, 49.4% of that, you know, is or considered organic waste. So all of that, if you think about it, could have gone to the Winton site. Um, recycling was about, yeah, 33.7%, which is kind of cool to see 70, 17% of that is glass. Um, with, you know, the glass recycling program, it's kind of exciting to think that that doesn't have to end up in the landfill. Um, so as a whole, yeah, 83.1% um, potential that doesn't have to go in the landfill. Um, so pretty exciting stuff that we can work with. Um, definitely a lot of potential for waste diversion going forward. Um, so that kind of gives a background of you know, what we're working with in the community, which is exciting. So carrying out this program, um, we're definitely gonna take it slow. We wanna do it uh, the correct way. We wanna make sure we educate everybody, um, you know, and take all the proper steps necessary. So there's a couple phases that we're doing um, kind of in this like rollout program. One of them is a uh, community drop-off points. So that will be more focusing on like residential compost that people will be able to bring from their homes. And then the second part will be more restaurant um, food waste diversions. Um, we're starting with back of house businesses and then we'll kind of work towards front of house. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about each of those. So specifically uh, the compost drop off points. Um, we did kind of just start uh, figuring out um, how this would work by just engaging with the community. You know, we wanna hear from you guys what works best. We want this to kind of be as collaborative as it can be. Um, cause if it doesn't work for you guys, you know, we want to make it work. So, um, any feedback would be awesome. So going forward, the drop off points for your compost, one of them is going to be at Sage, um, which is kind of fun. It'll kind of be on the side. Um, it's not there yet, but, um, it'll be kind of fun because then you can, if you're going to town, to get groceries, you know, you have compost, you can bring it there, kind of kill two birds with one stone. Um, the recycling center, um, you know, those hours of operation, um, in my mind have been established, you know, I collect glass at my house, you know, bring those there. You can also bring your compost, which will be really fun. And then the farmer's market. Um, so that will also be a really nice space to kind of engage with more community members. I feel like throughout each of these places for now, you know, this is kind of just like the initial compost drop off points. Um, but we, we would really like to engage with you guys in here any more places that you would like, because um, we can definitely make that happen. So, and then, so more about the drop-off point specifically, um, we will have, you know, a specific, specific compost membership, just so that you're able to drop off your compost. It'll kind of just be, you know, more of like an entry, just as, you know, 
an opportunity to educate and make sure that we can sift out all the contaminants. Um, so one of the things is that it'll be really accessible. We want everyone to be able to join if they're interested or able. Um, so it will be at no cost to you um, so that you know, anyone can join businesses, you know, residents, all of that. Um, and going off of that, we would encourage if you work for a business or you know anyone that would be interested in maybe sponsoring a compost drop off site, um, they could help offset some of that cost to keep it, you know, free, no cost to the community members. So, you know, an example of that would maybe be a business that had um, space and maybe a little bit of extra funds, they could buy a bin and, you know, we could get proper signage, um, you know, we can look, take a look at what that can look like down the road, but definitely a lot of potential in that regard. Um, and uh, we do want to have kind of a little bit of an intro quiz so that if you do join this, uh, you know, free membership, it's kind of just a nice platform for you to get educated on what products are accepted, what aren't, um, and you know, just kind of use it as spreading general awareness um, for people and you can kind of increase your knowledge as well. Um, we will also try to, with this quiz um, and just general signage as well, discourage, you know, contaminants and wildlife. Um, like I said, we do want to just kind of take it slow, hear from you guys what works, what doesn't. Um, our number one goal is just to have little or no contamination as possible, just so that folks up at Winton don't have to sift through that down the road and then it doesn't end up in our gardens. So yeah, wildlife will be a big one too in this area. As you guys know, bears are a big thing. So um, yeah, we've been doing some research on that, how to make you know bear-proof compost containers and having them locked just so that passersby can't go in and drop like garbage and stuff into it. So that'll kind of be exciting to see how that all phases out. Um, and yeah, through the membership, just use it as general you know, awareness about compost, um, you know, I feel like even just some Thad's um, conversation, you know, there's definitely a lot to learn and whether or not you've used it, it's just a nice way to kind of get educated on that. Um, and the second part of kind of this rollout in the community is um, focus on restaurants. So right now we have partnered um, with four restaurants in the community. Uh, one of them is Moonshin House, uh, Icicle, Yodelin, and Whistle Punk. So those are kind of our four main restaurants that we're working with who um, have showed general interest um, in the program. You know, sustainability is one of their core values. So they definitely kind of are already in line um, with what we're trying to do, which makes it exciting and, you know, fun. So we're kind of going through these steps right now with these businesses um, and eventually we'll be able to expand and include more. Um, but one of the first things we're doing is kind of just meeting and going through like site walkthrough, um, you know, meeting with uh, right now we're kind of just focusing on the back of house just to kind of, you know, not bite off more than we can chew, make sure we can kind of get everyone established, um, just do a little bit of minimal staff training, um, and then eventually we can get a little bit bigger. So just kind of see the space, um, you know, restaurants come in all shapes and sizes, so it's kind of fun to see what every everything looks like and what their challenges are. Um, a waste audit, all of the businesses are working with right now have already conducted a waste audit with Waste Loop. So we kind of already have that, you know, baseline data. Um, we're able to just kind of see where they're coming from and where we can go from there. Um, and yeah, every restaurant's different. You know, we're able to kind of cater what works for you, what your space looks like. Um, personalize it exactly for what works for you. And, you know, for an example, some restaurants to take out their garbage might have to use stairs. So like they probably couldn't use like a little rolling toter for their compost or, you know, buckets. I mean, there's a lot of options and it's kind of fun. So it's kind of a fun collaborative experience. We get to work with you guys, um, figure out what works. And, you know, we do want to stick with you throughout the whole process. It's not like we want to just give you, um, you know, these standards and then just like leave you to it. We want to be with you the whole time and things aren't working. We'll come back and we can kind of tweak it until it's something that works for you and your staff. So it's kind of fun and exciting. Um, staff training is a big part of that. You know, I think by starting with back a house, it'll be a little bit less, but some restaurants, it's all kind of intermingled. So, you know, we'll kind of just uh, cross that bridge when we come to it with each space. And then bin selection and signage placement, that will be kind of um, cool to see each space too, depending on how much room they have, um, you know, what their 
where their waste is collected. Is it collected in an alley or is it like a whole building? So there's just lots of options, um, kind of a fun opportunity just to collaborate with people um, and see what works. So yes, that is all. Questions? Is this the floating um, one for questions? Oh, you have that, okay. Because I guess either of us could answer questions. Do you want to come up here? <laughs> <I'm> alone. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? Claire. Uh, for the uh, online folks. Um, for uh, biosolids, does that mean like, uh, like excrement waste or does that include uh, like can you compost meat or um, like compostable silverware and that kind of thing? So you you want to know the definition of biosolids? Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> it is the resultant solids coming out of a sewage waste treatment plant that has gone through an anaerobic digestion process. It is still what you think it is. <laughs> as well as everything else that's ever gone down your sink, your neighbor's sink, their shower, every time they wash paintbrushes, every time they put Drano down there to unclog the drains and everything else. So it's not just the ick factor of jello pudding hitting the ground. It's also all those chemicals and everything else is going through our sewer system. So, we say no to biosolids at our facility. I think there is a place for it though, really. After they're treated properly, there are places for it. And I, and I think that's good, but it's just not something that we want to handle. There's a second part. Can you compost like meat and bones and like compostable yes. containers and that kind of thing? Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's, it's not an issue. We're running temperatures hot enough and long enough that it, it breaks all of that down. Um, I was asking about um, transport. So what is the, how are you guys going to transport all the compost to the facility? And to some degree, how does that kind of fit into your business model? Okay. Are you speaking of the materials going into the composting, so the waste residuals or the end product? Good question. Or both. I, I was thinking the inputs for you. Okay. So the inbound materials, so we're working on putting together a system with truck, trucks, uh, multiple, and putting together routes actually. So we're right now, we're going through the process of figuring out routes. Uh, we're, we're starting to talk to businesses and, and people out there about uh, letters of interest of if once we get everything lined up, because it's a little difficult, a little chicken and the egg thing going on of how much is it gonna cost to do an entire route to pick up materials when you don't know how many materials you're gonna get and you can't give them a cost until you know how much you're going to get. So it's, it's a little interesting right now, but we are putting that together to be able to bring it in. And then on, on others, like we're talking with some of the food processing plants on the, on the fruit with the coals and the, and the waste products, it, a lot of those would be hauling it in themselves. So it, it's gonna vary, it's gonna be a multifaceted solution. And I think we have a question oh, online. online. Okay, so from Lissy, her question is, the county mandates us to control noxious weeds on our property, yet does not allow us to drop off noxious weeds in any of their sites. Can we drop off noxious weeds at this new facility? We've, we've had to make the decision based on the liability of noxious weeds. While our composting temperatures and the time that we do would break down the, the noxious weeds. However, if you have an issue with more blowing in from the outside and we're saying that we're specifically accepting them, that can lead to other problems that we, we could be pinned as spreading them. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have to say, no, we can't purposely accept them, unfortunately. We have, we have actually looked hard at this, this issue. I have one more question online. 
Okay, so um, Anna says she's aware of some industrial composting that can break down some surprising items. And she's curious if any of these items can be accepted. And some of them that she lists are compostable containers, meats and bones, pizza boxes, used paper products and napkins, compostable corn, veggie-based cups and utensils. Yes, all the above. That was the easiest one I've had all night. <laughs> What's the timeline? Timeline for a startup? Yeah, when can I give you my garbage? Um, <laughs> well, so um, we, we're built out so we can't actually start right now. Uh, I mean, legally, and we have all the equipment. Um, we're gunning for about like June 1st, if, if not sooner. It's, it's a matter of lining up enough of a daily volume to come through the system to make it economically viable to get every all the wheels turning so that's what we're working on right now we were hoping to get started sooner the snow has not actually helped <laughs> those paper bags that you buy at marson's and fill up and then uh during the city cleanup I think it's collection May 18th through, or April 18th through May, whatever. Um, the city comes around and picks those up for us homeowners. Are they going to bring it up to your place this year? Yes, they, and actually what a lot of people don't know, they've actually been bringing it to us for the past two years. Yay. That is what we've already, we've already been receiving that. And that's what we use for our test cell to, to start off with, was those materials. Um, because as you know, it being locked behind with the apple maggot quarantine and then the city was burning and department of ecology did not want to continue burning especially under covid and what could do for respiratory so they came to us and said will you take these early before you get started and we said you haven't given us a permit yet and they said well can we talk so we talked and then we started receiving that and I think it might've helped speed things up a little bit. Uh, so I have a question for Waste Loop. Um, so I think Wenatchee River Institute would be really interested in being a drop-off site. Oh, that's a good idea. Um, but my question is, how are you guys going about picking up from drop-off sites? Um, so we do have a new trailer um, that is able to accept, um, like it has a toter, what's the wording? Or yeah, um, yeah. candy cane lifter. Candy cane lifter. <laughs> and um, yes, yeah, so you can like roll a little toter right up to it and then it'll kind of like lift it and drop it into um, the trailer, which is like totally sealed. So like liquids and stuff don't fall out of it. Um, so that is ideally the, like first phase out of, you know, being able to pick it up. So we'll be able to have the trailer. And like Thad said, once we establish a route, we'll be able to kind of go from there. Um, so, you know, we could have some sort of schedule or pickup days. Um, you know, we've been talking with restaurants about what days would work with them. Um, we could maybe get some sort of route gone and then you could roll it out on certain days, just like garbage and recycling. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Um, Lucy is wondering if people who live up near the facility at Coles Corner can drop off at the site. Yes. <laughs> I like these kind of questions. <laughs> well, actually, let me. I, I I got a caveat on that. Not not yet, but soon we will be open for a continual drop off. So I, I guess I need to clarify. Is that all the questions? Oh, we got more. Okay. <laughs> Just a follow up for that question. Um, is there a minimum for people hauling in and what is the cost? Is it um, no, we'd... for a cubic yard or for weight? Or okay, something? we've been working hard on, on pinning these down right now on, on bringing in, we're looking at hopefully I'm correct on this, but $15 a yard with a minimum of 15 uh, a vehicle coming in. So if it's a pickup load and you got about a yard in there at 15, you know, and 
we've we've all we've already posted uh, a sign up that kind of gives you an idea of what size different vehicles and trailers and different things are too. So it's a you know pretty good judgment call. Um, and then we're, we'll have a scale rate too on weight. So we're we're just piecing all that together right now. Um, two questions. Um, one of which is, I know compost requires kind of a balance of, you know, kind of um, brown and green material in a way. Do you anticipate any deficits, you know, in kind of your supply chain of inputs coming in? Do you anticipate having too much yard waste and not enough, you know, kind of green material, for example? And then secondly, um, who is your market for that product? So are you thinking, are you going to bag compost and sell it at at you know Marsons, or is it sort of a you know residents come and get it by the truckload sort of thing? Is it a very local market, or is it kind of going to be shipped everywhere? Okay, I remember the first question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so at least on the second part, um, the the market is pretty much everything. We're you know I've, I came from an agricultural background, and so I've done a lot of work with orchards and agriculture. Um, you know, develop these other value added products too to go in, into agriculture. We've also done a lot of DOT projects and such. So I see it as a, as a wide, you know, a wide range market where it would be going to. Um, homeowners and in, in, in everything. I think when you look at the, the higher volumes, some of these projects can get pretty crazy. Uh, a washed out, pro I remember doing a, pro a washed out project years ago is 13,000 cubic yards on one shot. And uh, so, you know, it's, but marketing is very different over any other market. And help me remember your first question, I'm sorry. The first question was around sort of logistics of your inputs and kind of how you balance okay. your compost. Yeah, thank and you. whether or not you have, to, you have to like bring in other inputs to try to balance any Sure, it's, it is a balancing act. And so what we do is like with the brush in the, in the brown portion, We'll be grinding that and we can set that aside. So we know that like during the winter months, we, we do anticipate, we worked out a system for winter operations. You don't see everything coming in at that time. However, if we're doing a food waste program, we're going to be in excess of food waste at that time and not a lot of anything else coming in. So it's a matter of storing enough of the brown and the wood chips and the brush ground up into a pile so that we have that material to blend in and make those recipes. So that's part of the whole program to get that balance always and get the right recipe going in those piles. And then to, and one thing I didn't, I didn't mention on the technical side, but with the leachate, because we, with that cover going across it, we're separating all the storm water from the leachate. So we're containing all anything that's dripping out from underneath the piles. We take that leachate because it's all in one spot. We don't have any discharge we use it to inoculate the new piles that are coming in. So therefore it actually helps us by getting a consistent microbiology across everything. So even though our recipes might change slightly from pile to pile, we're trying to get as consistent as we can. Uh, I guess I had a follow-up question to um, like having Winton as a drop-off site because I live just like right across the street. Um, can we, we'll be able to bring our food waste day? Like, will there be like a drop-off for like, you know, just people with their, their kitchen waste? <laughs> Wait, is that for waste loop or for? Well, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but the, oh, yeah. the yeah. drop-off point cool. at, you would leave it, you live across the street. I live across the, the street off. from Winton. Yeah, live oh, at from Winton? Corner. And I'd like to drop my food You're waste our off there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. You haven't been over the site yet. <laughs> but, I have actually. I, I run and bike over there a lot. Okay. So. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, yeah, you'll be able to drop that off right there. Yeah. No, there's no, there's no minimum. For, for neighbors, we might kick in some special deal. Yeah, I don't know. Have you met Andy? Uh, Andy will set you up. Or, or Rob Ed over there in the back row. Okay, so 
Anna's wondering, is there an upper limit to what you can receive at this point? Wondering if rural neighbors can bring in large loads of cut brush or slash materials. Um, when we throw the doors open for real, there is no limit. Uh, right now though, we can't really start up operations until we've got everything set and have a daily run to be able to go because then we needed to bring in that's when we bring in the grinder for daily continually going uh, up up until that point we can't justify bringing in a grinder and doing those sorts of things so the answer is hold on just just for a little bit more <laughs> Uh, how will we know when the doors are open? Are we are we on an email list? Actually, actually, I can do that. I've, I've set up like a constant contact um, account, so that is one thing that we can use to reach out. Waste Loop is is working on those kind of things in social media. Uh, we've talked with the city to be able to to help with promotion as well. So there's several outlets. We'll, we will be making an announcement when the, the the time does come. So through several different avenues. Anybody else? Everybody online, go quiet. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for the opportunity. You know, I've got my card over there too, so you can always email or contact and um, phone number and everything on there. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. And thank you to all the online people for attending. <laughs> all right. Thank you. <laughs> Have a good day.